All right, let's get to the uh, super chat. I mean, the uh, mailback questions, courtesy of the diehard members, right? Oh, yeah. If you want to become a diehard member, make sure you go and sign up. Some cool perks in there. You sign up, you get 20% off. What else? Free t shirt. What else, Devon? <laughs> Great stories written by these guys all the time, especially during the postseason. Fantastic work by them during the postseason. Although it was just one round, Michael, just one round. You got great work from these guys. It wasn't That's our fault. All it was year only round. One round. Hey, we were but busting our butts during the playoffs. Great work from them. So you get those stories. You get Bo, Zach, Charlie. Now we have Jim Salisbury. Les Bowen is part of the team as well. So if you come become a diehard member, you sign up. You get great stories there from everybody here on this panel. Not me. Maybe Bree. Occasionally, I'll pop up on yeah. the uh, There's on, some round table on the round table, like the writing yeah, side of things. Yes, it's fun. Go sign up, become a Die Hard member. You won't be disappointed. It's a really cool piece to be a part of. Uh, the community, again, that we're building, that's part of the community. So we hope that you can uh, sign up to become a Die Hard member. Now let's get to some of the mailback questions from the Die Hard. All right. What, uh, Bree's got the... Here First go. one. From Mike, of the players no longer under contract, who will you miss covering the most if they don't return to the team? For any reason, so personality, basketball ability, whatever. It's an easy one for me. Yeah, Kelly. Yeah, I, I think he's. I think he's number one for the same reason that when D House left. Yes. He was toward the top of the list because Kelly was good for an insane quote every single press of and some. I don't mean insane like he's a crazy person. Just like whether he's egging on somebody, talking trash, a turn of phrase, whatever. He's a really fun guy to just, and very easy for content to just, hey, here's 30 seconds of what Kelly Oubre said. And I I had a pretty good relationship with him this year. So if he's not back, yeah. I'll miss him. I, I like having guys around who are liable to just say absolutely whatever. It's been the joy of covering Joel throughout his career, right? Well, that is the that, basketball. Yeah. I, so ideally, every player that we cover would be as good as Joel and have a personality like him and Kelly where they'll just stand in front of a microphone and say, yeah, I don't give those $100,000 tickets. They're giving away to celebrities. Like, what a bunch of losers the Knicks are. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the ideal the as a reporter. Room. But just on like a human level, I enjoyed – my time with Kelly this year. For and sure. I wasn't around the guys as much this year, obviously for the first couple of months of the season, I couldn't be there. And then the latter part, it was more just being back here in the studio, occasionally going to practice and some games, but not being around them. So I don't really have one. Uh, Melton was cool just because it's more for the guys that were here last year and one from this year that I just know from their connection with Mikhail. Yeah. And that's, those, they're, but they're good guys. So um, that those are the only ones that I could really truly say because being around Tyrese Maxey, he's not going anywhere. Same thing with Joel Embiid, he's not going anywhere. It, it, Paul Reed is a good guy to be around also. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But it's more, I guess, Melton and, and campaign, you know, just because I know them a little bit differently from their closeness with Kale. I'll say this. The Sixers have had very few, if any, genuine, like, annoying or bad guys to deal with in the locker room like i i would say the one who was slightly controversial when he was here was jimmy but jimmy was a, a was gold mine room, for yeah. us like and he was he's never he didn't cross the line and he was just there were days when like anybody he's we'll call him surly is that a good word for jimmy for there, at times days yeah. he didn't really want to do the whole song and dance with the media and that's fine but he's interesting like i what I don't really care about is if someone is mean or annoying from time to time. Cause ben, that's, that's, we're talking about Ben. Yeah. Ben's as close as we've gotten to a bad person even, to deal and with. And even he is. And like, he was more aloof than he was confrontational. Yeah. I, it was never, other than the only times that Ben got close or maybe crossed the line if was he when asked he, about the jumper. Yeah, and then it became like you don't know anything yeah. about basketball, blah, blah, but those were the worst. I I also kind of accept that the media is always going to get if you question guys who frankly have put more work into basketball than I ever did or anybody in the media ever did, 
they're going to take it a certain way when you're questioning them and it, everything it took to get there. It so. would be funny if you just spent like as much time as an NBA player p- trying to play basketball, even though you suck. Like talk about just an enormous waste of yeah. time if you're, you know, six three with no jumper and you're just putting in hours and hours and hours per day. Feel the fight, buddy. So mm. I also I want to no. while while we're on this subject, D House. I said this on the show. One of the funniest people I think I've ever met in my life. Hearing him talk about like the merits of Bojangles versus <laughs> Raisin Canes, or I think he's a Texans fan, if I remember correctly. And KJ Martin and his lockers were very close together. KJ is a known Cowboys fan, and I can just hear in my head in his like Southern draw. Don't nobody care about those bitch ass Cowboys, <laughs> and just like. <laughs> All the things that would just fly around the locker room from D House. So whatever he contributed on the court was far outweighed by how many times he made me laugh with just all these random sidebars throughout the, what, year and a half that he was in Philly? Funny guy. Give him that. No, to your point, I think there's been very few that have been actually a pain in the ass to work with. Very few. And I've been doing this for, we don't have to mention my age, but I've been doing this for a couple of years now and it's few and far between. Well, and I'm not going to pat you or I on the back, but I think some of it is also, we don't go into the locker room trying to cause yeah, we try to trouble. Like I, I think that helps with the, the relationship side of things. Whether That's, you know, getting coherent answers, guys knowing that, all right, if I'm criticizing you, it's not because I'm trying to defame your character. It's because I, think that effort was bullshit or I think yeah. you need to work on whatever it is it's we keep it basketball and so that makes it pretty easy even James he was he was aloof he didn't necessarily enjoy the media but he, again he wasn't hostile yeah. towards anyone really yeah right. I, I personally I, I like James for he I wish that he would have opened up more say it's sort of similar oh, to Ben I did 100%, and we flat out told people around him that he yeah. helped him to open up more yeah yeah and when he left, I told, like... When he left, he opened up. Darryl Moore's a liar. He, he wow. always opens up when he leaves. <laughs> uh, and that, well, that was actually technically before he left. That was in the offseason. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Next question we get to. What do we got? All right. From hey, a Ron. Oh, Aaron. Discord member. Die hard. Hey, a Ron. Our get guy. get the bell ring on Friday. Right, who are some of the players that may find themselves on the market around the league due to the CBA changes slash second apron rules? So we do, we do have Mr. Numbers. It's a great here, question. But, so like uh, you're, you're looking into like two buckets. Teams that are looking to dodge the luxury tax. Teams that are up against the second apron, which is probably only a handful of teams. Um, and then just contracts, like long-term contracts that were signed in the previous CBA that are more damaging now than they previously were. Uh, it would be, yeah, you're, you're basically looking into those kind of three buckets. So I'm just going to give an example of a, a team. I think the Nuggets are a team that's going to feel the salary crunch because I think they're going to try to avoid the second apron. The most obvious candidate coming out of that team, and I actually talked about it with people in the, the Discord today, is Kentavious Caldwell Pope. And he's on, I believe his deal's for around 15 million. He's got an option that if he declines it, and that's not a certainty yet, like we'll see what him and his representation think. But if he declines it, presumably that means KCP thinks he's getting, let's say 20 million, or maybe he's getting 15, but it's over three years, so three for 45. Whatever it is. So he's an example of, I know people are enamored with this idea of go after the high value role players rather than Paul George or Jimmy Butler and whatever. I have pushed back because I think high value role players are going to get roughly half of what Paul George is expecting to make if he gets the max. But that's an example (laughs) of a team Boston is a second apron team, but I don't think they're they're probably <coughs> locked in on being a second apron team for at least next season, and then the hard decisions start to come. Phoenix seems like I was assuming Phoenix is just going to completely splinter, but now that they fired Vogel and it looks like Budenholzer is coming in, my assumption is they're going to keep things relatively static, right? They might swap out the vet men guys and try some different things, but... I think when you fire a coach after one year and bring in another guy, that sends a pretty strong signal that 
the big three are remaining in place. Who else is a – I mean, the Clippers. The Clippers are the big one because depending on what they want to do, it's either Paul George decides to come here, maybe Orlando, or he stays in L.A. Like in Tavius Caldwell Pope. Yeah. I didn't see this as being his – when he was in Detroit – and he was a young scorer in the league, and the defense wasn't really something that was high up on the <laughs> scouting report when discussing him. Yeah, I looked at Pope as a, a guy that was he was going to get paid when he left Denver. He did, and then he changed his his uh, his image of how, what type of player he was around the league. Do you think and anyone calls him Ken, <laughs> or is he strictly Ken Tavius or KCP? KCP? I think people will call him. Yeah, unless it's his parents or something, grandparents. I wonder if there's anyone who he's family. Because like, my so. My dad is a Ken. I'm just wondering if Kentavious is a, a unique one. So not yeah. sure how that works. That is and what nicknaming was, uh, conventions are Kentav- always interesting. Was it Kentavious Street with the Eagles this year from um, New Orleans? I think he was. I think he was. Ah, just 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 a Kentavious. Yeah, just talking about. So what's our next one? From Philly fan seventy nine, rank the rumored wing options: Butler, PG, Ingram, Bridges, in terms of best to worst fit on the 76ers. Thank you to Philly fan seventy nine. And I just want to say for AA Ron, like that's a question that deserves like a deep dive in yes. the summer, uh, and we will probably have shows based around that. Certainly written I think articles around be- that. This is more just like an overview answer. We yeah. will dot, and since you're a, a diehard member, you will have access to those. Articles, obviously, but that deserves a deeper dive, and we will get to it, I promise. So if you want that answer, sign up to become a diehard man. I do also think that's one that will become clearer once the season yes. is truly over and we get closer to the draft and have a better understanding of... So, like, for example, Denver loses and gets swept by Minnesota. Are they still leaning in, or are they saying, we got to scale back? We're not as close as we need to... So that's a... so. Back to this question from Philly fam. We have a family member has to be at the top of the list, right? It can't be. Yeah. Well, so we're talking just pure fit, like skill set wise, not necessarily impact, not like long term, just like how their Uh, skills fit with them. I mean, he says fit. But I think fit means a lot of things. I think the only thing that we're stripping out. Like I'm not just going like ranking my preferred options here. I think we're so strip out. The only thing I would take out here is what it's costing to get them. So take away that Mikhail is probably the hardest to acquire in terms of the outgoing value. Okay. Best to worst fit. Are we are we factoring in like long term, or just this year? Like just what their impact is now. Let's say for the next. Three years. Okay, so Mikhail's advantage of being 27 isn't quite as st- it's. They're still in there because he will end that at that time frame at 30 rather than like 37. Yeah, but it's not quite as steep. I think Mikhail's number one, and I'll tell you why. I think he's the guy who is most suited and most willing to be in the sort of role they need that person to be in, which is to say he will do the dirty work. He will be defending the top option or there's a night where Joel doesn't have it, then he'll step up as a scorer. I I think he has shown that he can do that and is willing to do that in a way that these other guys maybe have not. And I would put Paul George at the top if I had more conviction about who he is as a defender at this point. Like there are... In what I saw the Clippers, and admittedly, I don't watch them as anywhere near as closely as I do the Sixers. But from what I saw of Paul George, that defensive engagement comes and goes oh, at sure. this point. Yeah. And no shade to your cousin. He certainly had stretches of the season, Devon, where was not up to it as much as he was in past seasons. But I would chalk that more up to they lost like- team situation yeah. and... I don't want to say I can't get in his head, so I don't want to say discouragement, but I would say some of that is situation dependent where I would give him more benefit of the doubt than I would Paul George at 34, 35, 36, 37 
I don't think PG is that guy anymore. I don't think he necessarily wants to be that guy. In fact, I think there are Clippers media fans, et cetera, who saw Paul George hiding in the corner on defense in that series against Dallas and said, that says everything about who PG is at this point. If I believed Paul George wanted to be a number one assignment defender, then I might say he's the best fit. But I think for everything that entails, I think Mikhail ranks at the top of the list. Um, <clears throat> yeah, again, I, I would agree with that, not just because. I would agree with that if we're talking basketball, because if he's already shown that he can be the, the kind of player that can play alongside stars, Mm -hmm. where Devin Booker and Chris Paul were those superstar, all-star level players. And then if he has to step up into another role, he can do that. And then for me too, selfishly, um, in watching how he plays and always has played, um, the defense is one of the things I've always loved about Mikhail going back to his high school days, certainly in college with Villanova, and then seeing that translate to the NBA. I always loved that he could find his way, find his niche with the team and just simply help his team out to win. That's just what he does. And <clears throat> seeing him be acknowledged as one of the better perimeter defenders or just better defenders in the NBA, that was cool as hell to see him when he was finished second in all defense, um, I mean, pardon me, defensive player of the year in 2021. Uh, we thought he was going to win, even though the Marcus Smart, Marcus Smart was certainly deserving of it. I, we just kind of thought that he was going to win. He did not. No shame in that at all. He did make first team all uh, defense that year as well. And with the expanded role that he now has in Brooklyn, he's taking on a lot, of, a lot of the offensive piece of yeah. it. And one thing that he has said himself, not just privately, but publicly, he has said that he feels like he needs to get back to having the, the, the balance of both, um, being a scorer and then being one of the top two scorers and then being that defender that got him that name recognition on that end of the floor as well. So that's why I would think that he would fit best because of the age, the fit, and knowing how to play off of other stars, not taking it personally if he was not the star, and then going out there and just doing his job. He doesn't miss games, clearly. And um, he's still young enough where he's still in his prime and he's not even close to being at the end of that prime. So that's why I would lean Kale in that respect. I will say, if we were just talking about this upcoming year, I think you can make cases for both Paul George and Jimmy. Like, I, I think Paul George is a better shooter still at this stage. Like, over the last five years, he's shooting like 41% from three on really good volume. I think mm -hmm. that's valuable. Yep. Um, I trust Jimmy a little more to create offense as a secondary or even primary at times creator. So if we're just talking about this year, I think there are real arguments to be made. When you talk about it in like a three-year title contention window, that's where Mikhail's age comes into play. Uh, he will be in his prime during that entire stretch. Uh, he has, what, one year left on his contract? Uh, so you do then have to worry about re-upping him. But when you start talking about cost to acquire, like, first of all, I mean, there are reports that like five first round picks wouldn't do it. And like trading every first round pick you have just to the Brooklyn's going to reevaluate that this summer. That would be, you know, there's, there's. Especially if they don't get one of those, uh, like Donovan Mitchell thing, where now you're starting yeah. to hear the things about Miami and mm -hmm. all of that. If it's not Donovan Mitchell. And the Mitchell, Knicks being this legit, like then I who? think New York well, the, will the look Knicks at that. The Knicks and OKC and say, are the two that you really have to yeah. worry about. Um, but anytime you trade five first round picks and a max a guy, like there is some risk, even though he's 27, there would be some risks that come along with that. But when you're talking about a three year window, you expect him to be in that prime uh, for the entirety of that. Because of that, he vaults up to the top of that list. OK, so let's let's take Mikhail out of that. And I think we probably all say Ingram is fourth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We would say universally. And if you wonder why, just watch our last show. Hey, or was look that, at that. Was that Tuesday? Was that what that day was Wednesday? Tuesday. Wednesday? Tuesday. Wednesday? Whatever. No, no, that Two was shows ago. Wednesday. Wednesday. We Two did a shows. Brandon Ingram show. So we did 45 minutes on Brandon right. Ingram. You guys can listen to that. That was good. How would you rank? Found 45 minutes on Brandon It was a strong 45. That's right. <laughs> there, That's right. There are week 45s <laughs> in our backlog. That was a strong 45. Unless you like Brandon Ingram, then you will say that is a week 45 from us. <laughs> removing the, so we're saying we're removing the cost. How would you guys rank PG and Jimmy? I go, I'll take this one first, since you guys always go first. Yeah. I'll go uh, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, and then I'll go Brandon Ingram. Uh, the Paul George for me is because while both he and Jimmy have the shot creation, the shot is better. 
when we talk about the shot needing to be taken on this particular team with this personnel with Embiid and Maxi, I feel more comfortable with Paul George taking that shot because he's more willing, quite frankly, than yeah. than Jimmy Butler is. And then, uh, although he, I mean, he has played in a role where he has other players around him, whether it's Russell Westbrook or or uh, Russ, OKC okay, Russell Westbrook, and then being with James Harden and Kawhi Leonard, I. I, f- I think I feel more comfortable with the profile of Paul George when we rank them, why I would have him at the top. And, and that's, of course, no knock on Jimmy Butler because he's second. But I would, I would go Paul George first. I think I agree with you. And I, I know I've been – I feel like I've been more pro Paul George this week than most people expected. Like there's been a lot of PG pushback. But end of the day, the skill set is still a great yeah. – great complimentary fit next to these guys it's just the i get the skepticism on the intangible front of what they need and i also frankly can see the cracks showing (laughs) as he gets into his mid to late 30s of i brought it up this week his ability to create leverage and i do think as a just a pure shot creator even with the wear and tear Jimmy has, I do think he's a more durable Agreed. and reliable shot creator in the playoffs than Paul George is. Yeah, so I think in terms of fit, I think Paul George is a more seamless fit than Jimmy. Like the shot is important. I think he will age better than Jimmy because, like I said, the size, the shooting, uh, the high release point, I think that will all help. I think he can be a, you know, we, I think we talk about like his drop off, like I said, from being a first or second option. And I think that is legitimate in some cases, but I think he should be a third option for a couple of years. And that's important when you're talking about this kind of a commitment. There is still a part of me that wonders like in the playoffs next year, Jimmy might help you more. There's, yeah. Yeah. I just, I can't completely shake that. So I don't necessarily know if I have an exact ranking right now. I have to determine how much I weigh each one. I think it would probably be Paul George than Jimmy than Ingram. But I think there is, like I said, there is some case that I might just trust Jimmy in the playoffs next year more, and they might need that. Um, but the fit is definitely better for Paul, and the aging I trust a little more with George, too. May not be the wrong answer, at least for those top two. Whether yeah. you sw- well, the, However the, you want to swap them. The real truth is you're probably answer. not going to get your option of either one. It's whichever one actually becomes available, whether that means Paul George leaving L.A. or whether that means, I mean, at this point, it seems like Jimmy being on the trade market is very likely. But you're... The odds of both players wanting to come to Philly and you having your choice are low, you take whichever one you're going to end up getting. Correct. 